Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out to this session here at 5.30. I know it's kind of late. Uh, one of the last sessions of the day, but hang in there. I think lunch or dinner's coming after this. I'm Jim Freeman. I, uh, I'm a director at Rackspace. I work in what we call security engineering. Um, this is Michael Zinn. He is a senior security engineer. And uh, what we want to talk to you about is about the paradigm shift and kind of moving away from your typical information security guy and being more engineering developer type. And I'm going to talk about the differences, um, what those are. Keep pushing the button. We didn't, have, we didn't QA this. Well, while they do that, I'll talk a little bit about what I wanted to talk about, which is kind of yeah, our agenda today. So the first thing I want to talk about is background. How do we get here where security kind of encompasses everything? How do you go from physical security yeah. to cybersecurity? How do you go from cybersecurity into okay. coding and testing? Those are the type, type of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about what the problem is. What do we see today from a security, information security problem? And then what is the solution? How do we get better? Still not working. Okay. Should, uh, can you follow along with them? Yeah. Let's do There you go. Sorry about that, a little technical difficulties. So back in the 1990s, um, security kind of came around and we had physical security, we had computer security, and kind of things that they were kind of designed to do is kind of keep the bad guys out, kind of defensive mode, build up the walls, we've got firewalls, we've got NetSec, kind of monitor that, what does that look like? It wasn't at all think about software. So software became the de facto, Let's put everything in one group. Your corporate security in, in, involved in information security or IT, uh, physical security, compliance, your auditing, and then your security awareness program. These kind of things fall into your security, your corporate security group. Uh, it's pretty common throughout a lot of companies. But why does it default to corporate security teams when their, their whole entire mission is basically to defend and protect uh, and their people, data, and assets for a company? They had, not developers, they're not engineers, some of them are, so don't want to put that in a stereotypical way, but a lot of them don't have the skill sets to develop tools. When you look at security and you look at companies, we, we spent a lot of money. Uh, I kind of looked up and in the last couple of years we were averaging about $50 billion a year on security defense, security protection. Um, and when you look at the software, field, we about had 532 increase in our cert incidents reported since 2001. So obviously we're spending more money on security, but we're getting worse at it if you look at it some software. Companies are saying our operations security is not working. We're spending all this money, we're hiring all these great people, but they're not solving our problem. Um, that's because they don't know why we are having these issues. Software is providing a tunnel, APIs, VPNs. This is not hardware stuff, this is software stuff. We have more bugs, more problems. The battlefield is changing. Since 2005, we had seen an increase, not only in bugs, but vulnerabilities based on software. Software development, and when you look at it from a cycle, it's develop, design, develop, release. Design, develop, and release, and that's kind of quick. Um, but it goes fast. When you, have, when you go fast, you have more bugs. 
So most security flaws are invisible to conventional testing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later when I talk about application testing. But basically we need to design and build security from the beginning when the concept is there. We need to get our guys in there and help. Kind of make security part of the DNA uh, of the development. So Connor kind of talked a little bit about the problems, but what about solutions? I said, Jim, we always have a problem. What's the solution? So about three and a half years ago, I got a call from uh, Rackspace, and they called me up and said, hey, you're doing some great things with civil engineering, nuclear engineering. What are you doing? And I, I said, I work in security, coding security, testing for security on the application side. And so what I mainly worked on is if you had anything to do with civil engineering and you wanted to get billed or you wanted to put PII information out there, you had to build a system to talk to us. So while I was not part of the corporate security, I was part of the field security, what, I, what we called in the civil engineering side, field security. We are making sure that information that's being passed between our client and us was secure at all times. So let's talk about your typical corporate security guy. I know that's probably, if you're a corporate security guy, you go, golly, you know, you're really still typing me. I used to be that guy. So, although that's not me, because he has more hair than I do, but, and he's probably better looking. Um, but the, the whole job is to keep organizations safe. You want to make sure that you're safe. They want to make sure your computer is safe. You want to protect the data that's on your computer, on the networks. They want to build IDSs, monitor the network, have logs, put asset, asset controls, uh, very network centric. What these guys are focused on is the infrastructure. They want to defend and make sure it's safe. Software security and operations. This is uh, what we call information security operations centers. These are the guys that monitor, they want to look if there's any suspicious activities. Um, most companies that do this are run by operational people. They're not developers. They're not technical in the sense they can't program uh, very, very heavily. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying not all of them can, but most of them can. Um, but again, it goes back, what were they started? They wanted to make sure that we're protecting our band boundaries. If you think about the military, they're for defend and protect. So a couple years ago, and I, I say a couple years ago, um, early 2000, mid 2000, the term application security kind of came around and it was built upon a need. We need to kind of test our applications before we release them. Um, the problem with that is they had a lot of can test. And if you, anybody who's ever used Veracode know they can't, they can't scan Python or dynamic languages. And when you look at the type of companies that came in and did that, what they did is they had a can test, they ran a test, they walked over to the developer and said, here's your problems, have a nice day, where's my money? kind of a short way of saying they weren't really helping them. They weren't really saying this line of code right here is the problem and we need to show you how to fix it. One of the things that, uh, that we, we have, I, I know for us, is finding guys who can develop and find security. And it's just not out there. The skills are hard to find. One of the things that uh, I, I interviewed uh, for this, uh, not I didn't interview, but I was uh, interviewing a person for a position. And I kind of, one of my famous questions is, what do you think about third party testing? Because to me, this will tell me what kind of person this is. If he tells me that I think it's great, we should always use them. I, I, the interview should pretty much end there. And I'll tell you why. Everybody here is some kind of technical. Anybody can learn how to do security testing, but can you, can you develop securely? That's what I'm looking for. So when you bring in third-party testers, they're going back to the application side, and uh, what we were looking for is more technical. Again, going back to the development side. The bar is too low. I know Fortify and Denim Group, we actually used them when I first came to Rackspace, and it was the same old story. Test, report, goodbye. I will say this, and, and I meant to put them on here, was uh, Montesano out of uh, California. They actually did, they were actually pretty good. They hired developers who understood security, had daily stand-ups with the developers, looked at the code and said, here's where you have the cross-site scripting. This is where your cross, 
request is coming from. This is your over buffalo and, and, and buffer, buffer flow, eh, over, buffer overflow. Um, but they were able to sit down with them and do that. And that's where the idea kind of came is we need to go to that route. Product security, uh, it's made a long way. Uh, product security is a lot different. It's kind of like your QA. QA does, does the product do what we want it to do? Product security, does it do what it should not do? I.e., does it allow you to get PI information? Can you brute force in? Um, can you obtain social security numbers? It's part of the development process. You're working with developers, uh, but you're not doing it from a building standpoint. Good step, great place to start. Uh, it also measures how secure a product is. We talk about product security. I know that a lot of people uh, in information security get a hard time about that. And I always tell them, I said, that if Ford builds a car and they put, um, it's coming up there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I heard, um, it, when Ford builds a car or, or any car manufacturer, they don't go up to their information security guys and say, hey, can you go test our car to make sure it meets all standard safeties and security requirements? You just don't do that because it's fit and designed for a different skill set. Product security goes beyond the simple CIA. It's an excellent team uh, to partner with. Uh, some teams actually put them in the QA. Some actually put them in, in, in development. It kind of depends on where you, you as a company want to put them. So. That sounds nice, Jim. Great, we want to have developers who have security-minded stuff, and then we want to put them with QA or development. It's a lot harder than you think. The problem is, if you have somebody very strong in security, and I know that David uh, from the OSSG sign up here, and he's really, really smart. Love the stuff he's doing. Um, and I'm going to kind of, kind of describe what this first bullet means. CISP doesn't teach development. I know. Michael has a CSSP, but he also develops. So we kind of want to put the two worlds together. Development, when you go to school, um, and this is getting better, uh, by the way, but when I was in school, uh, and up to a couple of years, there was no security programs. They didn't teach you how to sec properly program securely. It was, this is how the code, get it out, get it going, because the, the dynamics of software security has still not come out through. Then you have uh, you know, uh, old viewpoints. Why is there a problem? I am the security guy for this corporation. You will report to me. That's a problem. Uh, because that guy who says I'm cybersecurity doesn't really focus on physical security. Sometimes looks in the corporate side, I mean the compliance side, but to, that's only the risk base. What that guy's really doing is saying, hey look, security is security is security. It's not true. Security problems in software. So we know that we have a lack of access controls in some places. We are told that developers are told to produce faster code. We talked about that earlier. Faster code, more bugs. We know that through studies and metrics, approximately 50% of all security problems come from software. And that's just not security problems, but problems in general. We also know that there's a diffusion delay. Basically what that means is when something is released, takes two years approximately to find out all the bugs. So a lot of that could have been found in the beginning if we had the proper setup. Security is not part of the testing, uh, part of the development process. It's not part of the designing, it's not part of the building, it's not part of the testing. Other problems. Well, we know that the world open stack. Everybody's connecting, everybody's taking the code, everybody's you know deploying code. How do we get better at making sure that whatever we're using or deploying is secure? Uh, we know that you don't actually need physical access anymore, which makes it very easy for a bad guy to make an automated uh, attack. Automation to you know, GitHub, uh, someone who puts in their keys or, or passwords or credentials accidentally puts it out there, all of a sudden he has access to that. Guess what, he has all the keys to your kingdom. Everyone has different goals. And we talk about the corporate security, you have network security, you have developers who have a different goal, uh, not partnering together. And then, of course, security is actually af it's an afterthought. Um, security uh, is kind of be all the jack of all trades. 
I don't want to say master of none because those guys are really good at what they do, but they're asked to do a lot more than, than what they should. Uh, they're being overworked. So quick, quick story, if you've ever seen this, the movie Office Space, I kind of put a little scenario in the dev world. So the boss comes up and says, you know what? I need more code and I need it faster. Goes up to the guys, he tells his guys, we need faster code, and we need to get out the door. But where's security? Where is the testing? And so you, what you end up having is a bunch of employees, developers are frustrated because security says, whoa, I'm not signing off on this, this code or this product until I get to test it, which is way after the fact. It causes huge problems. Everybody's frustrated. From the picture, you can see that people are at a table, they're working together. It's a team environment. Everybody's together. It's problems are being addressed as they are found. So that's what we're trying to push here. This is what we're gonna to try to push here from the OpenStack community. How do we work together as a team from concept to end? So solving the problem. So I know having talked about this with many companies and many people, there needs to be a culture shift and ideology about security. It's not a one-shop all. It can't be a one-stop shop. Uh, software security kind of needs to borrow heavily from, from software development. And we must agree that software security needs to be a specialized and placed and developed in QE and moved out of the corporate, corporate world. Um, and I say that when you go to the doctor or you go to somewhere, like you want to have something, if you have a problem with your back, you go to a practitioner, he kind of sends you to a back specialist. If you have a problem with a knee, you go to a knee specialist. Software, we need someone who specializes in software. Just as you can't test quality in the software, you can't build security in the process if you're not there. The rise of the security engineering. We need a specialist who can find design and coding flaws on the fly as it's being addressed. Addressed by building better software design for design secure systems. Get away from the operational mind view. It's cheaper to build something and fix it on the right then and there than it is to kind of deploy and fix later. A lot more expensive in later uh, development. Software companies are already made shift to moving out of, the, out of uh, operations and moving into uh, QA and development. Here are a couple, a couple companies that I've actually talked to and kind of got some ideas about how we should run at Rackspace. Um, CH Toom Hill is uh, the engineering company I used to work for. Uh, Sigital came in and did a, what we call a BSEM study. Uh, if you guys are familiar with that, they come in and kind of say, how are you on a maturity model doing against other companies that are doing the same thing? Uh, of course, Microsoft, Google, there is an actual uh, YouTube video out there and he talks about the difference between corporate and product security. Uh, then I mentioned Montesano earlier about what they did on a testing basis from a third party. Skills required. If you notice, I put Python up there because um, we want help in engineering, coding, and design. And uh, Michael will tell you, every time I give him a resume, he'll come back and say, but yeah, they're great, but they don't have no security experience. Or they have security experience, but they have no development experience. So these guys are hard to find. And if you have anybody who has this experience, please tell them to call me. Not, not, not just because I want to hire them, uh, but I want to make a big deal out of it. You know, maybe, you know, for OpenStack, get them involved. Um, they must be able to partic all, uh, participate in all phases of the development process, uh, process architectural, design, coding, uh, testing. Must be able to review code. If you can't review code, how do you know you're going to find a, a cross site scripting error in code? Because we know Python can't be scanned by a Veracode static scanner. We know that Fortify can't scan it. We know Denim Group. And the reason I know this is because I talked to them and I said, first one to market, I will buy your product. And, and I, I told them uh, right then and there, I said, I don't care how much it costs, we need it badly. Uh, and they have to produce it because it's hard. Um, other skiers required, I put up there VMware, iNova, Hadoop. It would be really, really great if we had experts in VMware who were security development minded. It'd be great to put somebody in Hadoop who knew that inside and out. If you think about it, from a quality standpoint and a security standpoint, it's easier to test something you know really well 
So having known the background of a product, a lot easier. But we have a long way to go because we, have a, we don't have that many people who with this kind of skill set. Need good developer testers. And I, I, I say it again, they're scarce. So um, my information and Michael's information will be on the end of the slide. But if you know anybody, if you are that person, please reach out to me because at the end of the slide, um, the, the email address will be there. But please consider contacting us, N not, not for us, but for OpenStack. One thing I want to point out there um, is the three parts of what we're looking for. One part developer, one part tester, one part security. You make those three parts, that's what we're looking for. Software security is everyone's job, and that's kind of a cliche in security world. Everybody should think about security. Um, but from a, from a product standpoint, it's developers, it's security engineering, it's QA, and I mentioned QA because they have fuzz testings they can use and uh, automation test scripts that they can kind of use to put libraries of fuzzing strings in there. They can do things like that. Uh, we need security operations. You know, I kind of say they're not right fit for development, but they're the right fit for operations continue to look at architecture and kind of make sure that we're being, uh, they're defending our, our perimeter as far as the network. We need admins to think about, you know, before they give root access to everyone, they should practice a uh, principle of least privilege. Users must understand the value of a secure product. Um, Firefox was kind of came out long after uh, Netscape, if, goes if you guys remember Netscape. Uh, Internet Explorer kind of came around, uh, but it always had security vulnerabilities. And then Firefox kind of came um, and said, you know what, we're better than them. So it's a story, and, and I think from an OpenStack perspective, if we can sell the story, we're more secure, then it kind of goes with what Troy was talking about. We're gonna be kind of looking at a broader, bigger, bigger market from enterprises. And then lastly, our executives must understand the value in place in security engineering with the development in QA. I'll talk a little bit about organizational alignment. Someone asked me to put this in here, and I'm gonna go through it real quick. But if you, if you understand the security engineering is not network security or corporate security, it should be part of the QA and the development. Um, hire software developers with security skills. Uh, rename the, the department that doesn't conflict with your corporate security. And of course, make sure that, that they're set up so they can sit day to day with the developers and the engineers on whatever they're working on. Recommendations, get the team involved from concept to de development. What I mean by that is Michael as a developer and a security can sit down with the developers and say, this is the concept. Well, have you thought about this? If you're gonna use Keystone, there's some security implications that you might wanna think about. You actually sit there and start writing code with them. Develop and provide, provide security requirements. This is something that the OpenStack security group has done, and I think it's a great job and something that we, we should use and look at and test ourselves against. Have balance. Uh, don't say you cannot have a, you know, if you have access controls, don't make them so hard that nobody can use it. Don't make it so hard that users would have a hard time using them. Participate in peer code reviews. Don't just use scanners, because scanners will only look for what they are programmed to look for. In other words, there are, there's only certain things they know to look for. Michael has been known to break many APIs and many code in, in, the, in the OpenStack uh, community, and, and a lot of people have reached out to him, how did you do that? Because the scanner didn't pick it up. And don't toss bugs over the fence and leave them. Help track, fix, and deploy. Be part of the solution. Working in OpenStack. So what, what am I standing up here? Why am I talking all about this security developer versus corporate security? Because what I would like to do is kind of propose that we kind of join together, whether it be QA, but have a team that works together and starts working with the concepts, the, you know, the beginning, the deployments, working together and not just after the fact. Um, Michael is gonna show you a little bit later, uh, shortly, a demo that he's kind of worked on about building a tool in the testing automation frameworks that he can test for cross write scripting and buffer overflows. Um, create templates. Best practices are already out there, guidelines are already out there. But what kind of metrics are, are, as we as a community deploying code that has one of the simple things is buffer overflows. 
It's the most elementary error that you can find, and yet we still do it. Uh, and then continuous improvement. And then, of course, to get to that point where we want to be, where there's more people out there from the security engineering, mentoring and training. Uh, Michael uh, is, does a lot, of, a lot of time with universities and uh, mentors and trains them as well. So if you want to help out, uh, be part of that group, please feel free to contact me directly, or Michael. And then now, Michael's going to show you uh, this demo. What Michael did is he's been working on, one of the things that we struggled from, from Rackspace was we had to do a lot of manual tests on APIs. And so uh, Michael kind of came up with the idea of, obviously we need to automate this. How do we do that? Um, so with the help from testing automation tools um, and some of the other uh, QA folks, uh, we were able to, to get this going. Thank you, Jim. Switch. Do you need me to do anything? Mirror your mirror. I'm gonna show up. Here. Let me help you out. Okay, yeah, let's go back to what we just did. Yeah, it's just a that will help. Okay, if we go to arrangement, and we mirror displays. Okay, and now everybody should be seeing the same thing. Okay. Cool, Corey. Thank you, Jim. So, I have been spending a couple of years I'm doing API testing for all the time. Before I start, how many of you have ever uh, did the penetration test or API testing? Awesome. Yes. Let, let's talk about the traditional way of doing API testing and penetration testing. The first start point is that you ask for API documentation. So if we want to test OpenStack, Keystone, we just go here to check what's called, how to make it call, because we need to know how the product work before we do security testing. And sometimes you might find the documentation is not accurate, and it's very painful. Fortunately for Keystone, we have the client ready, so I just installed the Keystone client, and here just trying to get the authentication talking, and normally you would pass through, through the proxy, uh, Burp is one of the most widely used web app and security audit tools. So the normal process is once you got it working in Burp, you can check the re request to see this authentication, give the username and the password, the response, continue the token and everything. And the good, normal good starting point is always send this to repeater, which is the automatic filing tool. Uh, sorry, intruder. So if I send it to intruder, and you can see here, I can choose different position, different data points to test. For the payload, for example, I'm gonna choose fuzzing, just automatic stuff, this proof building, and if you click start attacking, The burp tool is going to illuminate all the data points, use the fuzzy fact you're given, and send the request to the server. In this case, I just spin up a cloud server running Dell stack. And you can check the status here, and you can check the, uh, what's the request, what's the response. Normally for security testing, we focus on some, you know, error message, like 500 is our now. So whenever you see, whenever I see 500, my eyes just light up. And from there, you can send the request to repeater for specific test. If you want to test the SQL injection, if you want to test authorization, authentication, you send each request to the repeater. And we do have a checklist to specify which error we should test. And this is just for one of the function. So imagine if just for the keystone, there may be 20 function calls. 
So we repeat the same process for all of the function calls. For each function call, we go through all the checklist. So it takes a long time for us to finish all the security testing. What happens if the developer give us a new version tomorrow? So we have to repeat the whole process again. It, it's really painful. And especially today, with the wide use of CICD, developer trying to release code almost every 10 minutes or something like that. How could we and security test catch up with them? Fortunately, in Rockspace, our QE team is using their framework for their function testing. And we reach out to them. And they already create all the module and the clients for all the function testing. We view that a perfect uh, tool for us to leverage at the same time. So what happened if we could write our test, the security test case, and give this to our QE team? Our QE team can run this test and the, if there is some failed test, they, they can see what's the, uh, what's the security problem, and they can work with the developer team, or they can work with us together to get this fixed. Let's see. Let's see the new way of do security testing here. So in this example, we're going to show how to automatically do the test for XXE. XXE is one of the security defects found by someone last year impacting lots of uh, OpenStack products. It enables people to read the file contents and scan your internal network. So if we create a test case, we can just give this to our QE team. Our QE team can just run this here. And you can see the screen. It, it tries to different fuzzing test with uh, uh, different attacks here. And this one pass, it's OK. It means it passed the test. And on the back end, we can always see it in the burp, see what's really going on here. Let's close this. If you look at the risk number here, it shows what the test is about. So basically, we just define an XXE, and, uh, and we'll try to what's the response for this. For this one, because we did not inject in the payload, nothing happened. It's really successful 200. What happens if we, in this, this example, if we include XXE here, and you can see the response come back, say the 400, say it's a bad XML. So it proves that the API we test is good from this defect. So that's the reason why all the tests passed here. This is really good. L let's see another one for the same thing. Let's do a buff overflow attack here. For buff overflow, we are trying to inject the long string to the data to say, to check whether the application did a, have been doing a good job of input validation. For a good input validation, you should always check the value for its type, range, length, and the format. In this attack, we generate some long strings here. And you can see, for this case, we are testing create a user function here. And you can, you can see from here, there's some test case already failed. Let's stop this because it takes a long way to run and check what's happening in the burp. If we come here.
here shows we want to create a user, and the username is a test uh, followed by some random number we generate. And for the password, we just create a super strong password here. I don't know how many is are here. And the response is 200. That means that our application successfully accepts this and creates a password here. And for this one, the same filing, but we, we just inject a long string in the email without, you know, add here. And they, the application happily accepts that email and creates it here. So if we look at this response, if we go a little bit further and we can see here, that's why the test case is failed. In this case, let me see. We're trying to uh, longer email, maybe with uh, 100,000 bytes of character here, and give us a 500 error back. According to error message, it's, it's mean an unexpected error prevented server from filling your request, and it's too long for extra and the one. So it means it cannot pro process this long password here. But if we increase the length more, and you can see here, the server just gave up a 500 error. All those 500 error might be abused to do denial of service attack. If we, if we want, we might send, you know, thousands of this type of request to server to see the server can handle that or not. Let's see an example of SQL injection here. So for SQL injection, oh, I'll see. For SQL injection, we are trying to iterate the request and put our injection on different data entries to see what's the response back. We are looking for SQL error message and possible time delay if we are trying to inject some time delay within the database. So far, everything looks good, and we can go back to, to our burp to see what has been really sent to the SQL database. So one of the examples here, and, and you can see for the email, we are trying to use the SQL injection here, or one equals one, and so far so good. It shows that our application is good in this case. I will stop the testing because it takes a long time to run. Currently, OpenStack supports two types of data format. One is XML and one is JSON. So for security testing, that's really light mile because we need to test both. Originally, normally, if we don't have enough time, we just cover XML or just cover JSON. We just choose one side, assume that everything is good. But with the help of the framework, it's pretty easy to switch. It's just a configuring file change. So for, for here, and you can see we use dev JSON here. If we switch that to XML, the framework is gonna change the serialization of the format from, uh, from JSON to XML. And if we run the same SQL injection, you're gonna see some interesting thing happens here. And you can see the first test case failed. What might happen here? Let's go back to check. If we go to the burp and see what the request has been sending. Uh, let's see. 
The first thing you can see here, just by switching the config file from JSON to XML, on all the requests automatically change it to XML without actual coding. So that gonna already save us a half of the workload we needed to do. If we check the response you can see here, it gives us an error message, but unfortunately in the error message it includes all the SQL statements. If anyone who did the penetration test, that's definitely that's not the best secure practice. You, you should never retain your SQL statements back to the user. So, so far for those 20 functions, let's see how many test cases we have. Currently we just write SQL injection, command injection, uh, pass traversy, authorization, authentication. If we run them all, let's do a dry run here. I wish I had time to run them all, but fortunately I don't have time. So as you can see, there are 52 thousand test cases already be written. So just by giving these tools to our KOE team, they can just run all these tools and only focus on those failed cases. And it will help both team and we can have a quick turn around. The best one thing, once we write this case, if there's new code push out, we might just add one or two functions to the new case and rerun the test case. It's gonna save a lot of time. It's gonna make our life a little bit easy, make everybody life easy. Thank you, Michael. I, I know we went over time, so we're gonna end it here. If you have any questions, we'll stick around. You have any Q&A? I guess my mic was off. So that concludes our presentation. Uh, I know we ran over time, so if, instead of having somebody walk up the mic, if you have any questions, feel free to come up here. We'll, be, we'll stand up here for about five minutes, five, 10 minutes, however long it takes. And I appreciate it. Have a good night.